Cool. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, this will be the physics lecture. We're hoping to run this uh, each Thursday of each week, uh, and we'll see how this one goes and see if it's worth continuing. Um, but you guys are kind of the test group for that. So thank you very much. Uh, so what we're going to be looking at today uh, is water's effect on heat, sound, and light. Uh, then we're going to go through Dalton, Henry, Charles, Boyle, uh, their laws, and Archimedes' principle. Don't worry about memorizing uh, whose law is what. If you ask me what Charles' law is, I don't know. Um, but we're going to go through all of those and see what they're about. Uh, and there will be some sort of practice questions we'll look at throughout. If you do have any questions, uh, please just type them in the chat box and, and I can address those at the end. Okay. So we will start with uh, water's effect. Uh, first one we're going to look at is on heat. Uh, so as we know, heat is transferred in three main ways, which are conduction, convection, and radiation. All right. Uh, so this is in your dive master theory. This is in the uh, instructor exams as well, is the actual conduction of heat that happens uh, with water. Uh, so you may have questions looking at what's the main source of heat loss in divers uh, and how much more heat do we lose. Uh, so the actual conduction of heat away from our bodies is 20 times more efficient in the water than in air, which is important for us to know as dive professionals, because uh, if your students get cold, they're going to be really cold soon, right? So we need to be aware of, uh, especially with different body types. Uh, I know there's a lot of guys I dive with that are very, you know, I don't wear wetsuits. I'm way too much of a man for that. They're also a lot bigger than me. I'm quite skinny. I get cold really fast. So definitely something to keep in mind with for me. So with a wetsuit, what's going on uh, is that water that we've conducted our heat into is being trapped against our body uh, so that it's not leaving us. Um, so again, your wetsuit should be really tight, right? Uh, water's effects on sound. Okay, so sound travels four times faster in water than it does in air uh, because water is denser and has more elasticity between the molecules. This is why it's hard for us to determine the actual origin uh, of sound underwater. So a lot of things are going to sound like they're coming from directly above you. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. Um, so when we're able to detect the origin of a sound, what's typically happening is our ears are you know, taking the sound from one side before it hits the other. And that sort of delay between our ears picking up a sound is what's allowing us to determine direction. Now, when sound is moving four times faster underwater, it's a lot harder for us to actually do that differentiation of distance. And it kind of goes a step further as well. Uh, so when we're underwater, it's not really our ear holes that are actually taking in the sound. It's more the vibrations that are actually going directly to our auditory receptors. And your auditory receptors are actually kind of back here. So if you've seen any uh, of sort of the newer models of hearing aids and stuff, they actually go behind the ear and will be magnetized onto the skull back here. So not only is the movement happening at a faster rate, but the actual point of reception is going to be closer together and further behind your head. Uh, if we look in this diagram here, we have a measurement of uh, the actual rate of transference. So obviously steel uh, is a denser material than water, water is denser than air, and you can see in, in meters per second the actual difference in the transference rate uh, of sound. Um, sorry. Uh, so it's not quite exactly four times. Uh, it's actually a little bit more than four times faster, but for the purpose of exam questions and anything you'll find in your theory, we'll use the number of four times faster in water than in air. Okay. And we're going to look at a few different ways as well that water is going to affect light. Uh, so our first one here uh, is your classic straw on a glass. Um, so I couldn't find any uh, images online of a reusable straw or degradable straw, so we've unfortunately got a plastic straw as a teaching aid today. Um, but what happens is when light is traveling uh, through the air and then transitions to traveling through water, it's actually going to slow down. And you may have heard before that the speed of light is constant, and that's why we use it as a measurement. 
uh, for things like light years as a unit, for example. Um, but that's only true in a vacuum, uh, like space. But it does actually change speed when we are uh, when we're talking about air and water. And this is where we get that bending happening. Uh, is because the, the light's moving at a different speed, and we call that refraction. Uh, and with refraction, objects underwater are going to appear larger and closer, and that ratio uh, is about 33% or, or a 4 to 3 ratio, um, which might explain why uh, I'm sure we've all had uh, people we know in diving who will tell you about, you know, the three, four meter shark they saw that day. Uh, you Google that species and you know for sure that species doesn't grow more than two meters long. Uh, that could be part of that, right? Uh, the other thing that water is going to do with light is it's going to absorb it, okay? In our order of the rainbow from red all the way to violet, uh, those colors are going to be absorbed. And starting with red, that's going to happen quite quickly, actually, okay? So at about six meters, we've already lost our reds and our oranges, uh, which is why you commonly see the red filters uh, for GoPros and cameras, because that color leaves right away. Uh, even if we get down to 30 meters, we've already lost most of the range of color, uh, apart from our blue, indigo, and violet, which will actually transfer much, much deeper. Um, so we've talked about the magnification that's going to happen uh, due to refraction, but sometimes the opposite is going to happen. Uh, and there's a phenomenon that we call visual reversal, where because our eyes are having trouble focusing, something that's actually fairly close to us might look much farther away. Uh, and for any of you that are tuning in that were diving here with us uh, in Koh Tao in January, uh, you know exactly what that looks like. Uh, so here we have um, some low turbidity to high turbidity water. Uh, and turbidity is just a term we use to describe the uh, level of suspended particles in the water. So if you really want to sound uh, smart next time you're on the dive boat, someone's going to complain about the visibility that day, you can go, yes, there was a high level of turbidity today. Okay. So with water's effect on, on our three uh, things there of heat, uh, sound, and light, uh, these are kind of our main, main, main terms. Uh, and you can find these in the handout I sent to you guys as well. Uh, but the main sort of facts that are going to come up within uh, PADI exams at the professional level are going to be dealing with uh, the speed of heat that we're losing 20 times faster, speed of sound traveling four times faster, uh, and the concept of refraction, absorption, visual reversal, and turbidity. Those are kind of our key terms. So we're going to look next at Dalton's law and partial pressure. Okay. Uh, so Dalton's law, again, you don't need to memorize whose law is what. You just need to be familiar with these concepts and how they work. Uh, so, so his law is that the sum of all gases will always equal a whole, that being 100%. So when we actually increase pressure levels, we're getting that uh, compression factor, right? So we're getting more molecules in a smaller space when the pressure increases when we're descending diving. Uh, so as we increase, we have a term that is the partial pressure, which is gonna get larger because it's measuring that there are more oxygen molecules or nitrogen molecules, or whatever molecules in the same amount of space. But we need to remember that these aren't percentages because the percentage won't change, right? Air is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen roughly. Uh, but those are the numbers we're going to use for any calculations that we're doing with air. Uh, so if we look at this table here, and you can see on the right-hand column, we're looking at depth, okay, from zero meters uh, down to 30 meters. Uh, and as most of you probably already know, uh, every 10 meters of seawater has the same pressure. It's equivalent to the pressure that already exists on the surface of our atmosphere on top of us, okay? Uh, so if we look at the total pressure, the bar, we always have one at the surface at zero meters, okay? That's our atmospheric pressure. And every 10 meters lower we go, we get another equivalency uh, of pressure, okay? 
So again, if we're looking at an air tank that we're breathing underwater, the percentages of oxygen and nitrogen are staying the same, but the partial pressures are gonna increase. So if we're 10 meters underwater, the partial pressure of oxygen in that tank is gonna be what, 0 0.42, which is saying that we essentially have the equivalent number of oxygen molecules in each breath as we would if on the surface we were breathing 42 percent oxygen okay the percentage hasn't changed because there's also more nitrogen in each breath uh, but we are breathing in the equivalent of 42 percent oxygen and that continues in a linear model um, as we go deeper in depth now why is this important for us to understand um, oxygen becomes toxic to human beings when it's highly concentrated uh, so a high partial pressure. Uh, and so within recreational diving, we set a partial pressure limit on the amount of oxygen that is safe for our body to handle, okay? Like many limits in diving, this is a very conservative number, um, but it's tried and tested and it, it keeps people safe. Uh, and what we're trying to avoid is what we call uh, CNS, oxygen toxicity. And what that is, is when we are breathing high partial pressures of oxygen, uh, it becomes toxic to our body. And what we're trying to avoid is a convulsion. Um, the, the high levels of oxygen can trigger convulsions that on land wouldn't be typically too much of a problem. Um, but underwater, the body spasms and the lack of control, uh, especially due to this usually occurring at greater depth, uh, results in almost for sure drowning. Uh, to some degree. So we set a limit of 1.4 is a maximum and 1.6 as a contingency limit on the partial pressure of oxygen. Um, within recreational diving, you'll never go above 1.4. Uh, the 1.6 number is used uh, in some forms of technical diving, uh, but again, for professional level examinations, uh, they will want you to know those two numbers. Um, now, this is mainly going to come into play with uh, nitrox tanks when we're actually increasing the amount of oxygen available to us in the tank. Because if we remember the actual usage of a nitrox tank, it's not a benefit to us to have a higher level of oxygen. It's only a beneficial property for us is that we have less nitrogen in the tank, which is giving us the expanded limit. The reason we're actually increasing the oxygen percentage in a nitrox tank is just because it's the cheapest, safe to breathe, readily available gas that we have. Um, so if we want to calculate for a particular blend um, what the maximum depth we can breathe it to before we reach that 1.4 limit, uh, we need to know our starting um, oxygen percentage, and then we can use uh, our 1.4 limit to find uh, our maximum operating depth. So if we use a standard Nitrox 32 tank, uh, which is probably the most common blend of Nitrox available, uh, there's obviously 32% oxygen uh, in the tank. So if we take our maximum of 1.4 and we divide it by 0 0.32, we'll get this number of 4.375, okay? Now that's not saying we can't dive to four and a half meters maximum, okay? This is telling us the pressure that is the limit for our depth, okay? Uh, so if we convert that pressure into meters, we would get 33.75 meters, okay? Remembering that one atmosphere already exists on the surface above zero meters. And then for every 10 meters, okay, uh, we get another atmosphere. So we, all we're doing is subtracting one and then multiplying by 10 to get that answer. And we'll go through another one of these questions. If that's confusing for anyone, uh, please just send me a message. We can work on this more. So we have a couple practice questions here uh, with the nitrox. Uh, so if we had a nitrox 28 tank, um, we might wanna know if we are diving at 20 meters, okay, what is our partial pressure of oxygen gonna be? All right, so at 20 meters, we have three bars of pressure, okay? We have one bar on the surface, another bar for the first 10 meters, another bar for the next 10 meters. So three bar of pressure. 
And we know that the oxygen percentage is uh, 28% or 0 0.28. Now all we need to do is multiply that together and we get 0 0.84. So the partial pressure of oxygen at 20 meters would be 0 0.84, which tells us uh, that it is less than 1.4, which is that limit we discussed, so it is safe to dive, right? Now, that's a great way of doing that, but if we want to find out the maximum, we can do this again for a nitrox 36 tank. So right away, nitrox 30 tank, we know the surface partial pressure is 0 0.36, which is 36%. So we will divide with 1.4 and we get 3.88, all right? So again, if we subtract the one starting atmosphere from the surface, okay, we get 2.88. We multiply that by 10 and we get a 28.8 meter maximum operating depth. Okay, so these are the two sort of calculations that we're going to want to pursue with uh, nitrox tanks and partial pressures in general. Okay. Yeah. All right. So next, we're going to look at Henry's law and saturation. Okay. So Henry's law states that if the pressure increases, the more gas will be dissolved uh, into the liquid. And if the pressure is decreased, the gas will come out of the liquid. All right. When we're discussing liquid here, we might as well think of our bodies, right? Because we are, you know, mostly liquid. Um, and when we're discussing saturation, basically saturation is that the amount of gas forced into a liquid uh, is equal to the surrounding pressure. So they've kind of hit that pressure limit where there's no more that can go in. Uh, now, if we get super saturation, this is when the pressure holding the gas into the liquid has really suddenly been removed. Uh, and now we have uh, bubbles forming as the gas is coming out of the liquid, okay? And it, it looks sort of like this, yeah? Definitely some supersaturation going on there. And, and why this matters to us is because as we are diving uh, underwater, uh, the nitrogen is gonna be absorbed into our body as we're going deeper, uh, that's being more and more pressure added and we can reach that level of saturation. Now, if we come up too quickly, we're going to be releasing that pressure far too fast and that gas is going to come out of solution at a high rate which is going to cause bubbling like that coke bottle which if it's happening in your body is obviously not good for you uh, and can lead to decompression sickness okay. uh, and here's a small diagram of, of the basic principles of that All right, we'll look at Charles' law and temperature. There is going to be a five minute break in the middle of this, mostly because I'm dying since I had to turn off my fan so you guys can hear me. Um, but we'll look at this now. So, as temperature increases, the volume of a flexible container will increase. And the opposite is going to happen when the temperature decreases. So, the volume will go down. Uh, you can think of anything that is talking about a flexible container in any sort of patty questions as a balloon. And if it's saying inflexible container, you want to picture a scuba tank. Uh, and for every one degree Celsius change, up or down, there is a 0 0.6 bar change in temperature. So if any of you guys have been diving and you notice that within the first few minutes of your dive, you feel like you've lost a lot more air than you should have, right? You might just get to the bottom of a mooring line or something and suddenly you're on 180 bar when you started on 200, okay? Um, a lot of that is gonna be due to the sudden temperature change. If you're somewhere here like Thailand, uh, you know, your tank could be sitting out and it could be 40 degrees. Now you're jumping into 28 degree water, you're gonna suddenly lose quite a bit of that pressure just in that sudden temperature change. And as we mentioned before, uh, the actual conduction rate of temperature underwater uh, is 20 times faster than there. So it would be a really rapid change uh, in the cooling of your tank, and then a little bit of lowering in the pressure as well. Okay. Uh, so just for example here, if a tank is filled to 220 bar, 
uh, and the temperature where this tank is is 28 degrees. Uh, and then we're going to hop into three degrees Celsius water. I don't know why you would. Um, I avoid cold water diving because I'm a wolf. Um, we can actually calculate what the temperature, what the pressure change inside that tank will be. Okay, uh, so 28 degrees to 3 degrees, we have a 25 degree change in the temperature of that scuba cylinder. Uh, and we know that for each degree, we're going to lose uh, 0.6 bar. So 25 times 0.6, we would actually lose 15 bar of pressure right away. Okay, so just by entering the water, uh, a 220 bar tank could go down to 205 bar. Uh, and this is a pretty realistic scenario of the kind of change in temperature that can happen uh, between a filling station, uh, whether that's indoors or on a boat and the actual water temperature you're gonna be using a tank in. Uh, and our second question here, true or false, if scuba cylinder was filled at 20 degrees Celsius, uh, then left in the sun rising to 40 degrees Celsius, the volume of the cylinder will increase. Uh, obviously not, it's an inflexible container. That would be the pressure that's increasing. Uh, and this is an example of the sort of question uh, that you can expect to find uh, in both dive master theory and in instructor theory. Cool. Uh, let's take a couple minutes break. Uh, I need to grab some water and I'll be back to you guys in just a sec. Cool. There are a couple people that asked me to uh, reshare the dive theory uh, thing, so I've just sent that back out. It's in the chat now if uh, anyone needed that. All right, say goodbye to Scuba Kitty. Uh, so we're going to look at Boyle's Law and pressure volume relationships. Okay, so as the pressure surrounding an object increases, uh, the volume will decrease and the density will increase. Uh, so think of your lungs, which I've misspelled, uh, and the air you're breathing for these ones. Now we've been using the uh, kind of rule so far that 10 meters of water uh, is equivalent to one atmosphere of pressure uh, or one bar of pressure, uh, but it, it, it couldn't just be that easy. Uh, so 10 meters of seawater, that is true for. Uh, if we are in freshwater though, lakes, rivers, um, it's a little bit different, okay? Seawater is denser and heavier, uh, so it's gonna exert more pressure than freshwater will. Uh, so for every 10.3 meters of freshwater, we get one bar of pressure. Uh, obviously the one bar of pressure on the surface or atmosphere is not gonna change. Uh, and if you see anything in any theory questions that are asking uh, you for gauge pressure, this is a term that is asking you for the only the pressure below the surface. Okay, so you would not add the one atmosphere of pressure above water 
uh, to any of your answers that you'd be giving for a question about gauge pressure. Uh, and does anyone know what kind of shark this is? This is a bull shark. Uh, if anyone feeling clever wants to guess why I've added this one to this one, um, this is because uh, a bull shark is one of the very few species in the world that actually happily lives in both salt and fresh water. Fun fact of the day for you guys. Uh, so we're gonna do a couple practice questions here um, with the effect of salt water and fresh water. So if a flexible container with a volume of 20 liters uh, is at a depth of 30 meters and is then taken to the surface, uh, we wanna know what the new volume is gonna be. So this is a balloon that's filled to 20 liters at 30 meters. As it goes up, it's gonna expand, right? So we need to multiply the volume by the pressure when ascending, okay? This is, you know, first question of the open water course, number one rule in scuba diving, never hold your breath, and, and this is why, right? So if this question is in salt water, we would first find the gauge pressure, so 30 meters divided by our salt water pressure, which is 10 meters equals one bar. It's gonna give us three. Uh, we then account for the surface pressure, so we add one, and we get our absolute pressure, which is four bar of pressure on this balloon at 20, uh, at 30 meters, sorry. Uh, so if we then multiply the volume by the pressure, which was 20 liters times four, by the time this gets to the surface, our surface volume would be four times greater, which is 80 liters, okay? With the salt water, that is nice and straightforward. We get nice round numbers, easy, easy, easy. We're now gonna look at an example of this uh, with fresh water, okay? Uh, so once again, we're gonna multiply the volume by the pressure, and this is in fresh water this time. So for finding the gauge pressure, it's gonna be 30 divided by, and now it's 10.3, okay? So now we start getting into our decimals and our less fun numbers, uh, and we've got 2.91 now, okay? We account for the surface pressure again. Remember that is not affected uh, by the conversion factor. So our absolute pressure is now 3.91. Multiply the volume by the pressure as in the last question. Okay, 20 times 3.91. Give us a surface volume of 78.2. So it's not a massive difference. Okay, the answer we got before uh, was 80. So we've now got 1.8 liters less. Uh, but the more in-depth into diving you get, the more important these things become with calculations uh, for more advanced diving. Really important to know that there is a difference in the pressure there um, that, that can have bigger effects. Okay. Now, if we wanna go the other way, um, we've brought things to the surface, we now wanna look at going back down. Uh, so if we're going down, we're gonna divide uh, the volume by the pressure. Uh, and if we're doing calculations that involve more than one depth, uh, they could ask you, this is at you know, 10 meters, what's it gonna do at 40 meters? Uh, something like that. We always wanna go back up to the surface and then bring it back down. So for example here, we've got a 10 liter balloon, which is taken from 50 meters to 20 meters in seawater. What is gonna be the volume? So if we look at our chart here, at a depth of 50 meters, we know the pressure is uh, six atmosphere, six bar, whatever you wanna call it. And because it's in seawater, we don't have to do that 10.3 conversion, correct? And we know it's 10 liters. Now, if we bring it back up to the surface, all we need to do is multiply the pressure by the volume as we did in the last question, which would give us 60 liters. And now we're going back down, so we divide the volume by the pressure. So we take the 60 liters, divide it by three, and we would get 20 liters at 20 meters. Cool? Good. All right, this is gonna be our last section today. This is about Archimedes' principle and buoyancy. And Archimedes' principle is that an object wholly or partially immersed in a fluid uh, is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object, okay? 
And the two numbers we need to remember here is that one liter of seawater weighs 1.3 kilograms, and one liter of fresh water weighs one kilogram. Uh, so if an object has either neutral or positive buoyancy in seawater and you take it to uh, freshwater, the buoyancy cannot be determined. But if you take an object from freshwater to seawater, uh, you can sometimes know. So if an object was neutrally buoyant in freshwater, it will be positively buoyant in seawater uh, because there is more weight uh, to the salt water. So it's going to help things float more. Okay, It can accommodate more weight. So we've got Mr. Archimedes here on the right. Uh, he is famous for supposedly having been naked in the bath and figuring out that him in the bath made the water level rise so you could use it for measurement. And he screamed Eureka and ran down the street naked. Uh, there's some conflicting reports on that one, but it's a nice story. Uh, so I'll stick with that one for now. Um, so if something is neutrally buoyant, uh, it's going to be not floating or sinking, that's kind of our perfect thing. That's what we as scuba divers want to be. That's why we do buoyancy checks at the beginning of our dive. And, and then we can call things either negatively or positively buoyant by their weight. So if we want to know the buoyancy of an object, there's three things we need to know. How much it weighs in kilograms, um, how big it is, so it's displacement, uh, which is calculation of its size in liters, and then what kind of water it is in. So whether it's fresh or salt water is going to affect how much uh, that uh, that weight is being offset. Okay, and depth has no impact on this calculation. When you're doing your instructor exams, your dive master exams, they will list the depth in the question, and that is purely there to throw you off and see if you actually know what's going on with these questions. Okay, so the actual formula for calculating buoyancy, we've got a bit of a memory device, which is open water diver. Uh, so the object weight divided by the type of water it's in minus its displacement in liters will give you its buoyancy. All right, we're going to look at a couple examples of how that works uh, just now. So if you plan to recover 150 kilogram outboard motor in seawater uh, that displaces 60 liters and lies at 30 meters, how much air must you put in the lifting device to make the motor neutrally buoyant? Okay, so we are adding air to a lift bag to increase the displacement to offset those 150 kilograms. So it's in seawater, and we know it's 150 kilograms, so we're going to divide by our seawater number, which is 1.03. Then we are going to subtract 60 for its displacement. And if you have a calculator at home and you've done that calculation, it is going to give you 85.6. Uh, but 85.6 what? Okay. So if you get a positive number at the end of this calculation, it means it's negatively buoyant, which can get a bit confusing. Okay. Um, but yeah, so this item we can now see is 85.6 kilograms negative, uh, which means we need to add that many liters to its displacement to make it neutrally buoyant. Okay. All clear on that one. Uh, let's look at another example. Now we want to sink something, uh, and this time into fresh water, and it's an object that weighs 50 kilograms. It displaces 300 liters, but we want it to stay on the bottom. Okay, so we don't want it to be neutrally buoyant. We actually want to make it 10 kilograms negatively buoyant at the bottom. Okay, so we know it's 50 kilograms. We divide it by its water, which in this case is fresh water, so it won't have any effect on that number. And we subtract its displacement, which gives us minus 250. Okay, it's opposites with the answer. So if we have a negative outcome, it means it's actually 250 kilograms positively buoyant. So it's a very, very floaty object. Now, 
to bring it back down to neutral buoyancy, okay, we would uh, add 250 kilograms. And since we want to make it 10 kilograms negatively buoyant, we add another 10, which gives us an answer of 260 kilograms uh, negatively buoyant at the end of this calculation. Okay. Cool. So that was uh, a quick run through um, of some of the basics, uh, the most common questions you're going to encounter uh, within professional diving exams uh, in terms of physics. Um, we covered water's effects of heat, sound, and light. Uh, we looked at Dalton's law, Henry's law, Charles' law, Boyle's law, and Archimedes' principle. Okay. Um, if you have any more questions uh, on any of this stuff, please send me an email, find me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm always happy to uh, share some stuff with you guys. I have nothing better to do. Um, I need to stay fresh on these things too, so this is really fun uh, for me as well to share this with you guys. Uh, same time next week, we're going to do the same thing uh, on physiology. So looking a bit more into uh, what's happening with our bodies underwater, uh, different types of decompression sickness uh, that can affect us, um, and some of the effects that can happen on your body during things like freediving. Uh, so if that interests you, I will see you guys next week. And um, so yeah, thanks very, very much, guys. This was really cool. And uh, I hope to see you guys all soon.